All right, guys, I'm here with Frank. Frank is a warrior poet employee. He's been with us a long time. I liked hiring him because he's from Venezuela. He doesn't understand capitalism, and we actually haven't paid him ever. <laughs> so uh, he doesn't speak much English, as far as I'm aware, so I'm going to translate uh, for him. So, Frank, what is it like being in America? Uh, I like it sometimes. It's okay. Um... He said his name is Frank. It's it's fun to uh, shoot gun sometimes with you. I can't understand the thing he said. Uh, please pay me. Um, uh, no in T and O. You uh, said I I owe a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as fun as that intro was, uh, Frank, you've been working here uh, with Society for how long? Now? About, uh, a year and three months. Now. Oh, your, your accent is much better all yeah, of a sudden. Yeah, I learned. You're quite a good teacher. I no wonder why. You know, it's amazing. Guy, uh, guys viewing in, I want you to close your eyes and listen to Frank's voice. Now, Frank is not a huge dude. He's Latino. He was born in Venezuela, raised in Venezuela, and moved to the United States later on. But he sounds exactly like Sylvester Stallone. So close your eyes and listen to this. Adrian! <laughs> Just talk No, I'm kidding. Uh, well, hello, guys. My name is Frank Enriquez. Thank you so much for having me here, the place where I work. And, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to see you again. What was it like fighting Ivan Drago? It was... Were you afraid? At first I was. Well, obviously I lost the first time, but... Um, but I, after what he did to my friend, I had to get him back. So hey, it's it's you know, a it's a good deal. I had to get him back. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, as uh, somebody who grew up in a different country, the background of Venezuela, in case folks don't already know, mm -hmm. uh, fill us in. What's been happening over the last two decades in Venezuela? Right. So the situation in Venezuela has been very troubling, particularly for me. I still have a lot of family that lives there. We have hit a huge economic. Um, disaster, the probably propelled by the uh, inflation that reached about 10 million percent. 10 million, 10 million percent, percent inflation? Which, which to me is almost unfathomable. I don't really understand what money means in Venezuela anymore. And so all of that, you know, obviously has fueled a lot of crime, a lot of shortages all over the country when it comes to medicine or food or any, any other or things that are needed to live so it's been a really really rough time for me and, and my family particularly as well so. very sorry what was it like two decades ago I mean, it was a flourishing capitalistic and very free country right and then all of the sudden I mean it was one of the richest countries oh, in all the Americas and now it's fallen it's destitute yeah. so um, so yeah absolutely Venezuela was one of the strongest economic economies in, in South America. In the 80s, they had a lot of FDIs coming from American companies. Even Ford came in and built huge um, factories in Venezuela. And this is where Venezuela was heading towards more of a capitalistic system. But then with the rise of Chavez, the rise of Chavez in 99, all of this began to decline. And, you know, the inflation started to rise, crime started to rise and a lot of the nationalization of private companies took place, which really, really took down the, the quality of products and the, the satisfaction of customers in the country. So, you know, I moved here in 2010, and even at that moment, I was still living with a lot of hardships. I had to, I had to live with water cutoffs, completely unannounced. We had a schedule for electricity cutoffs that would sometimes stick to the schedule and sometimes they would just be completely random. I remember, you know, taking showers, the, the water wasn't treated properly, so sometimes I would have trouble, you know, with my eyes, it would hurt my eyes, so it would hurt my throat. We would have to have, you know, gallons of water sitting, sitting next to uh, our showers just in case they cut up the water. So, so definitely moving here was, one of the best decisions my family has taken, for sure. Uh, you had, you did some current research of just like, what's going on in Venezuela right, right now? What's it like to live there right now? Right, so 
you know, everybody has heard that the situation has gone pretty bad, but it, it gets really disheartening when you really look at the details. Uh, when you look at, you know, maternal mortality had increased 65%, uh, in infant mortality 30%, cases of malaria about 76%, oh, and um, about 80% of the population is food insecure. And what What's I, food insecure mean? That means that every day you don't know, so you're not sure where your next meal will come from the next day. Got so 80% of the population is not completely certain that they will have a full nutritious meal the next day. Wow. So that obviously leads to about an uh, average weight loss of 24 pounds for the average Venezuelan. Every, which, you know, the average Venezuelan has lost 24 pounds. Yes. Yes, in the past wow. year. Wow. They're, yeah. they're starving to death. Yeah. People are starving to death with wheelbarrows of worthless cash. Right. Yeah, yeah. Cash is completely useless. I mean, uh, when I went back to Venezuela not too long ago, my mom handed me this bag of cash. And I was like, well, I'm not going to start. I'm rich. I'm like, well, what am I doing here? Dollar, dollar. And we were just going to get gas. And that was a tip. We didn't even pay with that. We tipped the guy that. Oh, wow. We paid with a card and we tipped the guy a whole bag of cash. Wow. That was worth probably around two dollars, <laughs> something along those lines, if anything. So wow. you know, and also let me add another thing about the statistics I just gave you. Yeah. The health minister that actually published these statistics was fired immediately after by the government after publishing these, you know, kind of impacting news, and that tells you that these people don't really care yeah. about how the people are doing. They don't really care to get it, you know, to improve the situation. They just care about the image so that they can continue to do what they're doing. Yeah. Um, they're, they're not interested in, in getting help because they believe, you know, the America is the empire and they, they hate it for some reason. And I don't particularly know the solution, but it's, it's, it's really, really tough, you know, to, to see it happening, so. It's funny that a lot of, uh, right now you're graduating college, when? Today. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you have. We've been sharing you with the university. Yeah, we have yeah. enjoyed doing it. Very excited to finally have you full time. Me too. Me too. Way to finally be done. Very but much. when you look at your peers throughout your liberal arts school, you see a bunch of uh, gringos, a bunch of Americans mm -hmm. right there, North Americans. You're American or mm -hmm. uh, South American. So anyway, a bunch of North Americans and there's something Nothing is quite so American these days as hating America. But typically right. when I meet folks that grew up anywhere else, they come to the U.S., they're the patriots. Right. You know, and I'm not, I mean, I'm not biased. Right, as you can see. Hey, no. this is just my, this is just my America king. That's yeah, all. That's, that's what, what, what do you think about your peers and anti-America everything? And you're on the other side. You're like, you love America. Yeah, I definitely, that's one of the things I noticed when I moved here was that you would have these people that were very critical of the country. And I'm not particularly against being critical of your country because sometimes you need to be critical in order to advance. You know, you need to point out the flaws. But there were many times where I felt like they were being a bit ungrateful. Right. They were not appreciating the system, not appreciating how just truly the United States is, even when it comes to, you know, you have different sides, even just the the way in which you can, I don't know, uh, debate things is much more civil and much more just than Venezuela or other countries like that, where you just don't see the people being hurt as much as they are here. Yeah, and, and, and there they can silent, they can throw you in jail. There's, you right. know, they can do whatever yeah. they want. You've yeah. got tanks in the streets. And it happens all the time. Absolutely, free speech is gone, and so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, it, it seems like there's a package deal of ideologies that are always coming about in America, right? In North America, the United States is running toward those right here. Mm -hmm. And this is not only happened for Venezuela, because 20 years ago, you guys were prospering. And then all of a sudden, you have socialism, mm -hmm. uh, so anti-capitalism, anti-gun, and anti-free speech. Mm -hmm. You know, and all those things kind of go together and fall, and we're seeing some terrible stuff that's happening in Virginia right now. A new bill that's coming out in Georgia where there's anti-gun stuff and the hate speech stuff, which I don't want people to be jerks, you know, but if we, the cost of free speech is the right. risk of offending someone else. And so, anyway, 
I'm seeing these three things fall. So, you know, it's like Venezuela has already gone down this and reached the problems, and the United States is following them. As right. a Venezuelan, what do you you know what do you think about that? What would be the message of Venezuelans to your peers at university or mm -hmm. you know folks watching? Well, first thing I would say is you know be be appreciative of what you have, the power that your country has, the the opportunities you have here, and think a little further when you're trying to ban or restrict the regular individual from having things like weapons yeah. or things that can, you know, give them a fighting chance towards what can be tyranny. For example, like the military in Venezuela has been one of the biggest reasons why it's been so tough for the people to really voice their opinion, particularly a group that we call the Colectivos, which is an unofficial government-backed group. That is the people that are actually going out to the peaceful protests. They're armed, fully armed. And they are, you know, beating down and shooting at regular peaceful protesters, which hurts the ability for us to communicate our our uh, disagreement with what's going on in the country. So these type of things, when you when you have all the power and all the all the firepower in a certain group, then you don't have the ability to truly speak on a on a on a level to truly understand each other. Knowing that you don't have no power over me because at any point I can, you know, take care of myself as well. Right. Which is something that you know, working here, I think a biggest the biggest issue is a lot of ignorance regarding guns in general. A lot of people don't don't even understand what guns are or what what the the guns that they want to ban are. Right. You know, I've had people tell me like, oh, is that an AR? I'm like, yeah, this is what an AR looks like or things like that. Right. And they don't even, they didn't even know that to begin with. So I'm like, you know, yes, it is kind of a polemic topic, but if you are going to talk about it, you have to get educated, you have to get trained, you have to understand that, yeah, it's, it's dangerous, but it's a necessity in order to, you know, live in a safe, equal, free country. Right. It, it's, it seems to be, it doesn't seem to be, it's just historical kind of fact. As we're moving toward tyranny, the only safeguard of freedom Mm -hmm. is the right to defend yourself against governments. Governments are naturally going to consolidate power and want more and more, and once they get power, it never goes back. And right. so without the right to bear arms for everyone, it's just a matter of time before everyone ends that. And they don't realize that you vote yourself into socialism, which then becomes tyranny. It's the grandchild of socialism. Mm -hmm. But where you vote yourself into it, you have to fight your way out. And you can't do it. You're sticks and stones against machine guns and tanks. Right. And so I'm curious, as you were just talking about education and guns and stuff, do you remember the very first time me and you ever went to the ranger job? I think so, yeah. Out of uh, Georgia. Yeah, what, what did you think about that? Of How did you... Were your uh, views on guns different before you were so, running and gunning with me? So first, you know, obviously I didn't grow up in a, in a very a very gun kind of culture. In Venezuela, gun culture is not really the same as you probably could infer. Y'all look at us like we're crazies? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit, yes. But like a, the same, um, uh, my dad, though, yeah. my, my father actually was has always been a, an advocate for firearms. And he always carried a, a revolver with him. He wow. took me out shooting. He, you know, he made me understand that they're important. But he also made me understand that yes, they're dangerous and need to be sure. treated with a lot of respect. He he taught me, you know, always treat a gun like it's loaded, never right. pointed at something you don't want to destruct. All those things I kind of understood already at a very young age. Coming here though and working here, I had never been exposed to. We got cool you know, stuff, don't we? The we things like that have shut. Yeah, That's pretty cool gun. The sniper. And you had uh, right. AK right over there. You wanted to bring the table. You just didn't know what to do with it. I held an AK today, and first time in my life. Real? Yeah. Hey. Yeah, it was it was cool. They grew so, up so fast. They're definitely they're definitely a lot of fun, and I've learned a lot about how to utilize them safely. Yeah, and that you know you can feel safer while also having a little fun. Yeah, we're just forces for good in the world. We're the backstop. We're the fail safe yeah. of a waning. Yeah, and I love that about the word democracy. mentality as well because yeah. you know and he's not getting paid to say that. No, I'm really Are you not. on the clock right now? I'm, I'm really not getting paid. <laughs> it's 4.59, so <laughs> one more you're still scripted for <laughs> one more minute. Then you can say whatever you want, but, yeah. you, know, you know, I'm glad you're 
uh, not a fan of socialism because if you were a fan of socialism, like most kids graduating college, mm -hmm. most of you, a lot of your peers are socialists. Right. Blinding, and, right, but when you graduate with a four-year degree from a liberal arts school, most of them are anti-capitalistic, and then they go get a job right. at a capitalistic place, and yep. I'm like, they're secretly rooting against the companies that yep. are employing them. Yep. And so if if you're against capitalism, you're fired. <laughs> yeah, like, no. I, <laughs> what do you do about it? I definitely, you know, obviously, I like to approach these things with a lot of thought, you yeah. know, a lot of, you know, let me hear this side, let me hear that side, but at the end of the day, I think socialism is a flawed system. Yeah. I think it's unrealistic. It's too optimistic on the good nature of men, which, you know, as we've seen and as we see every day, there are bad men out there. There are bad humans out there, and yeah. you just can't, you just can't expect the same type of quality and the same type of production and efficiency that a free market will give you. I thought of the coolest analogy to teach socialism really quickly because my sons, we were uh, we were just in a Central American country like a week ago, mm -hmm. and uh, they were asking, hey, why are there so many stray dogs? My little boys were very interested in why there were so many stray dogs and why the streets were so dirty. And there was just, I mean, there are big holes in the sidewalk. I'm like, no, 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 this is how most of the world is, and this is a pretty, this is a pretty good one. They all have clean drinking water in the Central American country. and so. We're doing awesome. You know, half the world doesn't have clean drinking water. That was the last thing I said. So I wanted to teach them what socialism was. And I'm like, well, this is socialism. So this is basically socialism. That's really fun. I'm like, so this is socialism. You have all of your earnings. This is what you earned, right? So this is all of your money. Socialism does this. It says, good job, but we want to be very charitable. So we're going to take this. Very good. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, textures. We take, nah, that's not realistic. Here we go. I don't know what to do about it. This is a maybe tax right there. So we take all this. Now we distribute to the poor because we're such good bureaucrats. And, and we'll do this. Good. Do this. And then they go do this. This is what the politicians do. They say, you greedy capitalists, let's take this. And this goes into the pockets. Yay for us because politicians deserve it. And here's for the poor. And that's socialism. Yeah. You have all your stuff that you earn. We'll take it, pocket a bunch, because we got to take away from the greedy capitalists, but then the greedy politicians pocket it and then redistribute, and they call this moral virtue. It's stealing from what you have done. It produces nothing. It takes, lines pockets. It's it's calling someone greedy so that you can be greedy and redistribute it. Um, and I, it's, cheap, it's cheap and false virtue. Of, you know, I... I you know, the rest of us were earning, and then we distribute. Stealing from someone else and redistributing is not charity. Right. You know, it's easy to be generous with someone else's money. Right. So, anyway, that, and that's one oversimplification of a socialistic problem. But socialism produces nothing. It, it takes. Capitalism produces. Uh, right. So, anyway, I'm, I didn't mean to go off on a rant. I just thought that was a fun thing. No, and who, how agree. often do you get to explain socialism in bullets? And my first payment comes in bullets. That's useful, I suppose. Yes. Like that. Thank Have you been much. paid? Today? Yeah. It was in the, la in the last month. Are we behind? Because I wanted to. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. Whoa. Whoa so no. But yeah, I, I do agree. And, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of why I said the whole, you know, yeah. you're being too optimistic right. on men or, you know, women or whatever. Because at the end of the day, greed will attack. Right. And it depends on who, like, how many hands can reach what and the checks and balances right. and checks and balances is one thing that you know right. I look to the United States and I admire there's, cool. there's, there's true checks and balances there's true even if it's disagreement there's right. you know there's a conversation going that is at least somewhat transparent right. compared to in the in Venezuela that you know even uh, well recently I don't know if you've heard many of the details but one of the biggest problems is that Maduro the uh, non-legitimate president, uh, he he selected a group of people to be a constituent kind of like legislative body, which is against the constitution, but he had the power to do it. And Because he controls the military. And he had the Whoever military controls the guns does, does whatever they want. Yeah, so that's kind of what the biggest problem right now is that, you know, people are saying, hey, no, the head of our already established legislative body is now the, um, well, how do you say it again, interim? Interim. 
interim. Yeah, I was saying that a little far in there too, but uh, interim president. And the biggest fight is that, you know, right now for Venezuelans, we're really trying to get the military on the side of not only the up, the opposition, but right. just just transparency, just, you know, justice. And that's one of the biggest issues at the moment. So I want to talk about Chavez for just a moment. I have a uh, friend, he's a Latino friend, dear friend, uh, but he's all kind of like, Viva Chavez, Chavez was great and his policies would have worked had the U.S. not sabotaged it. And so it's really, he's progressive and he was a beacon, but the U.S. toppled us. And I'm like, okay. anyway, I've got some, I want to hear your thoughts on that. What do you think of Chavez and right. how would you answer uh, my uh, right. Latino friend? Hugo Chavez. Well, Hugo Chavez is kind of one of those leaders who had a lot of charisma. Mm -hmm. He was very good with people and he said the right things. Right. He said the right things to the people that wanted to hear it the most. The, those people that were very, you know, impoverished, that were having a very tough time. He came out and he kind of scapegoated. He kind of said, hey, the United States is to blame for this. They're bringing all these companies and they're doing all these things. They don't care about us. And he, he, he riled people up. And in fact, he, he tried to coop the, coop the duck and he yeah. was, Unsuccessful, unsuccessful, and after that, it kind of helped him for some reason. It fueled his popularity, and he got to power in '99. And since then, you know, you can just look at the graphs: the economic performance of the country, the I don't know, the shortages, risen, the the medicine needed, the 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 output of some of the most important companies in Venezuela, particularly the oil companies, are now a hundred billion dollars in debt to foreign creditors. And Venezuela is trying to pay them with Venezuelan bonds. And they're like, no, we don't want Venezuelan bonds. We yeah. want cash, we want dollars right now. They're not ready to pay that. So I don't really have a lot of nice things to say about Chavez. I think that he kind of just played the people, told them what they wanted to hear. He's known for, um, he's known for, obviously pocketing a huge amount of the money that was supposed to be for the people. Right. His daughters are known for living very luxurious lives all over the the world. So, I really, you know, I think that was one of the biggest mistakes that my country country took was giving Chavez the the power to to be the president. And now Maduro is, you know. Not doing any better. In fact, it's doing much worse. So, when, when I look at it from afar, I'm just kind of thinking, all right, you have one of the more natural uh, resource, natural resource rich countries Absolutely. in the world at the time. All so kinds too. it was Venezuela was crushing it mm -hmm. a while back. Then Chavez comes along, makes real sweeping political reforms, and then when it doesn't pan out, it's the U.S.'s mm -hmm. fault. And then it's kind of like, well, whatever system of government that you were implementing, it was so fragile that the U.S. would be able to take your country away. It seems right. just like really passing the buck. And I'm like, I don't, that doesn't have the ring of truth for it to me. Of like, right. that looks like a dainty, fragile system of government that mm -hmm. if another country can topple you so easily and accidentally, and I don't think many people really believe the rhetoric. It's a classic you know, yeah. scapegoat. Uh, hating America is a global past time now, and Americans are ready to heap on the shame as well and self-loathing, which is really just virtue signaling. But um, yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, at the end of the day, it, it wasn't true, I don't believe it at all. I think that the biggest problem was the expropriation or the nationalization, yeah. like I said, the, of private entities. This really just, drove down the quality, the quality of our meats, the quality of our just raw materials that were going out. And people were not interested in exporting Venezuelan goods. So we're importing Venezuelan goods. So that's kind of what started it. And he looked at the United States and he created this idea that it was our fault because, you know, the, the, the United States is this big, powerful empire and it was easier for him. Yeah. And, but like I said, you know, I simply don't agree. And, you know, obviously I believe in a capitalist system. Good. I'm working here. Because if you're not, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So yeah, and that, that's what kind of drives the qualities that drives that competition, right. drives that, you know, that in, in, innovation that's right. needed. So, you know, it might have some problems, but it's not, you know, socialism is not really the answer, in my opinion. Right. So, you know, I think you can, you can definitely learn a lot from Venezuela. A lot of times I say, you know, Venezuela is a bad example because of the corruption. But then I'm like, well, you know, socialism is very hard to achieve without any corruption ever because... Well, no government is yeah, free from corruption. Exactly. I look at my own and I'm not, you know, just... I'm, I'm taking your advice as well. We should be critiquing our own governments. Mm -hmm. and I can do that. I've spent, a, I've spent years of my life living in different countries. And so I know what the world is like, whether, you know... Right whether it's Central South America or the Middle East or, you know, Europe, I've been around, you know, and lived in some of these other countries. And so I can return and look around and be like, hey, guess what? There's a lots about my country that's broken. Mm -hmm. I see lots of corruption. I see all of that. But I'm like, but I think it's still the best thing around. And some of these celebrities or singers who want to make a political statement of some sort, they'll come out and they'll be like, if this happens, I'm leaving. And then they never leave because secretly they know mm -hmm. this is an awesome place to live. And you yeah. want to slam it, but then they stay like hypocrites and it reveals that they mm -hmm. they are disingenuous. Yeah. Uh, and other folks, all these college kids are living off American you know, uh, wealth and freedoms while rebuking it, yet they stay, which is the ultimate refutation of their own arguments. Of like, if you really believed it, you could go anywhere, but they don't. They right. stay, which means they're all a bunch of hypocrites and liars. <laughs> no, and it's funny. You'll hear people complaining about it and, you know, giving me all these. They'll, they'll teach me about Venezuela. <laughs> like I, I love have, that. I have American kids who, I don't know, took some like three 3,000 level social science and they, they will teach me about Venezuela while they're holding their iPhone and drinking yeah. their Starbucks. And I'm like, look, man, like, you know, I will listen to you, but that doesn't mean that you're right. You know? That's so, awesome. I wish I could have seen that. It would have been so great. I bet they still just disagree. Yeah, with you. no, it's, you know, it's very theoretical for them. Yeah. And when you actually have been in the practicality of it all, yeah. it's, you know, you're definitely way more inclined to, you know, live in a, in a system like we do now. And, you know, I did yeah. multiple tours to the Middle East of Afghanistan many or a, a bunch of times in Iraq and uh, just once Iraq for Afghanistan. Anyway, I got out, went back to college to get my degree mm -hmm. and uh, GWAT, Global War on Terrorism, was like being discussed all over the campuses and it would always come up, didn't matter, you're, you're like taking statistics too mm -hmm. and somehow that issue comes up and the professor is like, oh yes, let's let's get the soldier. And so they, they have all these theoretical ideas about soldiers and what it's like in the Middle East and eventually I'm like, you know, veteran ways, I'm like, so I remember in Afghanistan, because I lived there, <laughs> and we were fighting and, you know, we were good friends with the Afghanis that were nice and then the ones that they tried, that tried to kill us, That's well, right. we killed them first. <laughs> yep. We wanted to kill them right back and so it wasn't hypothetical to them. But still, it was amazing that you couldn't, that there's a certain indoctrinization that's happening when there's, you know, things, a suspension of reality where you can't argue with them because I think they didn't logically accept those beliefs. They fell in love with the beauty of, of, of the virtuous idea. And really, I'm preaching the choir here, but it is frustrating when you know we've experienced it, but still then this virtue signaling happens and... Yeah. You vote yourself yeah. into destruction. And so anyway, <laughs> glad you're here with us. And thanks for uh, teaching some stuff about Venezuela. Absolutely. And um, I'm going to get you one of these flag capes. Please, man, please. What do you think about that little poet patch right there? I like it. We should sell it on the site. Honestly. We should do that. Why don't you plug the site right now? What do you think? Hey, guys, check us out. We're a post supply co. You know, if you have any trouble, email me at support. <laughs> so, yeah, help you us can. help us give jobs to... To Venezuela, to hungry, hungry, hungry. Venezuela. You're always hungry. I am. Hungry. All right, let's sign it up, guys. Thanks right. so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Sure you are. Transform. Sure